Good morning. We call the Board of Supervisors in the session for our Monday, August 15th, 2022 board meeting. We'll start with public comments. At this time, anyone may address the board on matters of which are on the agenda. Please go to the podium, state your name and home address. Individuals wishing to comment on a public hearing will be given the opportunity during that respective hearing. Individual remarks are limited to three minutes. Do we have anyone in chambers wishing to address the board? Seeing no one in chambers, do we have anyone on Zoom, Kevin? We do not. Move along to the proclamations. We have no proclamations. Uh, go to the approval of minutes of the August 8th, 2022. Motion to approve. I will second that. We have a motion and a second to approve the minutes of the August 8th, 2022 board meeting. All in favor signify by aye. 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 Next, we go to consent items. We have a Class BB 14-day beer permit, St. Joseph's Key West, and a Treasurer semi-annual report. You can take those separately or in one motion. If there's any discussion on any. I will make a motion to approve consent items for St. Joe's Key West and the Treasurer's semi-annual report. Second. We have a motion and a second to approve both. Consent items, the Class BB 14-day beer permit for St. Joseph's and Key West and the Treasurer's semi-annual report. All in favor signify by aye. 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 There are no procurement procedures. Uh, we have no public hearings. There are no plats for approval. Uh, go to the action items. We have a resolution to approve the hiring of deputies, assistants, and clerks. Looks like there's four from Sunnycrest. Make a motion to approve the resolution hiring deputy assistants and clerks. I will second that. We have a motion and a second to approve the hiring of deputies assistants and clerks. All in favor signify by aye. 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 Next, we have a resolution to approve the letter of agreement with the deputy sheriff's union, and that is regarding the full time social work position. Is that the wages that were, is that on par with the deputy? We had talked about this position was going to be compensated like a deputy. Is that what that is? Do we know? Uh, no, this Perhaps we have the answer at the podium. Would you introduce yourself? <laughs> this is Tanya Lux. I am the HR assistant. So uh, the social correctional officer, or actually I think it's correctional social worker, um, is lined up with the correctional officer's pay wage. Not the deputies, but the correctional officer. Correct. And I believe that's how it was initially approved and posted. A scale is attached with that, yeah. Give me a little background since uh, our HR person has left. Uh, when and where were these decided? I believe when Joe and Dawn were talking um, about this job and bringing it to you for approval, it was set up that way. So the only thing that this would actually do would be to get it into the contract for the deputy sheriff so that it would then stay connected to that. Having moved it from part-time to full-time. Uh, no, the social worker was not a position. This was a full-time position that was recently, I think. For the region. Um, in May is here too, if, I can, if we need context. Yeah, that was the ECRA where 15% of it, or 50% was going to be um, through them for um, funding. And it was approved by you on six, well, Dawn recommended, approval for it on 6-7, um, and then it was posted to recently to be filled, and that was a need on July 1st of 22. 
Can you go back to the wages, Kevin? As I recall, our deputies accelerate very quickly through pay scale, right? And so this would be an extraordinarily well compensated position, which is what they wanted to do is to get someone who's paying the pay scale exceeded what a social work position might be in our community. Do we feel confident that that's the case? Right now, this is lined up pretty well with the social workers at Sunnycrest. Thought this was going to pay better than this actually but pardon i thought the compensation was going to be higher faster just like our deputies i would point out the sheriff's association has uh signed off on this and we have someone who's accepted the position correct This agreement not only, well, this agreement puts it into the collective bargaining agreement. Do we also have a personnel requisition? Or is that following? Personnel requisition would also have a wage. I, I think the personnel, well, the personnel requisition was already approved and that was with the, but what does it I, say for what wage, is the wage? Per the union it just contract? says per union contract. And that may okay. have been the confusion on okay. why, whether it was a deputy sheriff's line or the correctional officer line. Good enough. So then this would solve that. So I was hoping that maybe there was a dollar amount on that document already. I just asked May Hinchin as you sit there, if you see a red flag for wages, I'm not that. When we have everyone's in agreement, and apparently I just am misunderstanding what was presented. If, if you would like, yeah. I was just doing the math at each of those steps, and um, the range there is fifty three thousand to sixty seven thousand from step one to step five, which is in line slightly lower than what they hired in Johnson County for the same position. So Johnson County generally has a higher wage reimbursement than Dubuque County does for many positions. So I'm not terribly um, concerned about it. I, it. It could have been a little bit higher, but I think it's okay. I appreciate your input. Tanya, I appreciate your help too. No problem. As you came right out the door. <laughs> Here, do, do you know the signature on there? Who is the president of the Sheriff's Association? Is Aaron Potter. Okay. Aaron Potter from Potter's Hill. Yeah. yeah. That's what I thought. <laughs> I'm comfortable with it. If uh, there's no more dialogue, I'm willing to make a motion. I'll make a motion to approve the resolution for the letter of agreement. Second. I have a motion and a second to approve the letter of agreement with the deputy sheriff's union regarding the uh, social worker position. All in favor signify by aye. 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 Next, we have a resolution to approve the amendment to the fiscal year 2023 to 2025 collective bargaining agreement with the deputy sheriff's association. And that is just striking uh, the sunset clause at the end of it uh, regarding the June 30th, 2022, unless both parties agree to continue beyond that date, which we have. So it's working well then? That was when they changed to the new schedule, the 6263, 6263. A motion to approve the resolution. I will second that. I have a motion and a second to approve the amendment to fiscal year 23 to 25 collective bargaining agreement with the Deputy Sheriff's Association. All in favor signify by aye. 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 Next, we have a resolution to approve allocation of ARPA administrative expenses from the county's ARPA SLFRF allocation.
that is in the amount of 532,000 that's for the budget analyst position and then the program single audit costs not to exceed 18,000 correct so were there any other costs apparently that we're going to try to recapture <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Um, I don't think we've identified anything else at this time that we're looking to put into administrative expenses. Is there a reason that we're not looking at that more aggressively? Like I know Ed Raber's probably a half time of Ed's position could easily be assigned to the ARPA administration for contract creation. It's something that if the board is interested in, we can develop further. Um, I haven't heard that expressed exactly, so. But the last week, this does not include internal cost allocations for our ARPA time and energy. Correct? It does not at this time. There certainly will be management, administrative oversight from the auditor's office and certainly from other corners as well. We could develop a cost for that if we want to, by resolution, allocate that to the ARPA fund. Through eighteen and a half million dollars, maybe we could have brought that up earlier. But I, I'm my thought is it's not probably that necessary at this point. I don't know the benefit of it. I would appreciate um, at least. Continuing, I, I'd like to have discussion about this ongoing. Okay. How is it going? How much in, How much is the county spending with time and talent? Um, because the use of the Biden administration money was not intended to harm county administration. In fact, it was intended to allow us to not just do grant awards, but to be made whole. And that's how I perceive being made whole is accounting for some of those costs. I'm not uh, disagreeing at all with Supervisor Wickham. I think that we're probably going to absorb it, but if we don't try to at least, um, you know, I come from the law where you track every six minutes, you just track time and you bill it to something and Rhodes does that too. They bill, uh, you know, they, they, they bill their time all on every funding stream that they work on. It all gets billed back. So, I would like to ask the administrative team to be noteworthy of that. I'm not asking you to track your time, but I do think that we should be sensitive to the possibility that we need to increase this line item for more expenses for the county. I agree that the uh, county does need to uh, recoup some of the expenses related to this brought that up initially before we started discussing how much we were going to give away that we should decide what the county should hold back. Yeah. <laughs> so, 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 so the reality of doing this though, is if you, if you actually spend more time and energy accounting for more of this, you're actually taking away from core county work. We're not receiving any more money. The additional funds we've already received and have declared a loss uh, are eligible for our normal county funding operations. Granted, we're down to 1. 1.6. 1. We're down to 1.6 million. Um, and so it doesn't really matter if we if we declare that we spend 50 grand over here or if we have 50,000 of the declared loss still left. We can use that at the discretion of the state of Iowa laws. So by adding more administration and more burden to the county employees, not benefiting the county and our operations any. The money's already here. We have discretion to spend the money as we choose on salaries or other items. And we're not receiving any additional funds for doing the other work, right? That is all correct. So my thought would be do the best you can, <laughs> but, but in the end, it's not changing our balance sheet or our ability to have 
additional funding initiatives. I agree with that, um, but I do think that this person we're going to hire, I, I, and I see we have our, our IT director in the room as well, we could be working toward creating perhaps something on our website that's robust, that shows the money going out. I mean, we could use this to do something that we can't, don't currently do. We don't have anything like that, and this might be something people are interested in following along with. Um, anyway, it's... Uh, yeah, I 100% agree, and I would, I'm willing to make a motion to approve this resolution because I think having a budget and analyst position is is wise, and uh, having a Looks like, is this an external audit that you're anticipating at 18,000? Yeah, so the single audit is required when you're using federal funds over 750,000 on an annual basis. So this program will always be audited specifically. That's the cost estimate for that. Yeah, so all that sounds wise and glad we organized it. I think we are in agreement generally that we would like to have the team spend some time, not again, not tracking your time, but coming back to us perhaps with an under an appreciation for how much administrative time is being spent. It doesn't need to be next week, but I'd like to see something for sure in 30 days. Ed, I would like to have you give us your understanding of how much time you've spent to date. And I think there are some weeks it was probably 40 hours a week uh, wrapping into the weekends working with people. So. Uh, that's what I think there's there's not a, a prescribed method of going forward. You have those skills to to do that, but I would be interested in knowing from you additionally uh, greater communication about that issue. I'll make a motion to approve the resolution, um, basically stating the Dubuque County funding requests and then how we're gonna Let's just see what it says here. Strike that. Uh, approving the resolution, allocating $550,000 of the SLFRF funding allocation to program administration expenses. I'll second the approval of the resolution as presented. I have a motion and a second to approve the allocation of funds for the administration expenses. Amount of 550000 All in favor, signify by aye. 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 Next, we have a resolution to approve the allocation of project funds for Dubuque County Broadband Master Plan with gap analysis with the county's ARPA allocation, and that is in the amount of 50000 for the gap analysis fund. Could we have Nathan? Sure. Nathan? Yes. Do you want to address the board? Good morning, supervisors. Um, this is from the previous two, three weeks ago during that presentation on Middle Mile, the study for the county and anchor institutions, the cities, the townships mirrored on what the city of Dubuque has spent the last year accomplishing. Um, I had a sample in that document at the time. The, the full document is not yet published, so we don't want to make that public yet. But Cliff Notes version, yeah, have a master asset data gathering of everything in the county and in the townships and the cities that would have value to have some sort of broadband infrastructure ran to it. It's not specific to middle mile, it's specific to broadband. Um, if middle mile ever does come about someday, this would be leveraged for that, but this is not, it's not wedded to that. It's, it's a master map. Um, and specifically, it's not just saying, oh, there's a library here. It's, there's a library here and there is no penetration into the building. There's no graceful way to get into it. So this is part of that. Um, so like EOC would be an example. EOC is very easy to get into. When they built that, they built several vaults with multiple four inch conduits from those vaults 
into the facility. So as an example, in this instance, the document would show EOC, the details, what it is, and then it would identify the locations of those vaults and as the target. So if you were to bring additional conduit to the EOC, you're not targeting the EOC, you're targeting those vaults. And that's significantly cheaper if you're doing a build out because you know you can get into the building easily. Whereas another building, I'll just pick on a library, you would need to know there's no graceful way to get into the building. You, you would need a budget to have a vault installed, core drilling, where approximately in the building. So this is all stuff that would be documented in this study. So when you're <clears throat> projecting costs out, whether we're doing it, whether an ISP is doing it, it doesn't matter. I mean, every whoever would do this build would need this information. You can then know, okay, well, no, this EOC would be five grand to get into the building and whatever, whatever, but the library might be 25 grand because there's no infrastructure in place to get broadband into that facility. So those are hypothetical cases. Hypothetical. I'm just making stuff up, but that's that's the data that would be gathered. The name, the place, the reason it exists, contacts. So who do you call to gain entrance to the building, permitting, that sort of stuff. Okay. What do you plan to spend the funds on? So do you plan to hire an actual outside consultant? Would this be travel costs? What, what would be the typical expenditures for the $50,000? So my goal is not to reinvent the wheel. This has been successfully done by our friend, the city of Dubuque. I need to work within the parameters of the ARPA funds. So that will be the ARPA team helping me figure out how we do this. Um, I don't want to get out ahead of the skis on this. Um, hypothetically, the way it could work is GDDC is the manager. They are the aggregator. The, they're doing the weekly meetings with whoever is gathering the data. And ECIA would potentially be the data gatherers for this. Some travel expenses, some time. I mean, so you would anticipate ECIA a check going to ECIA for their work because they normally they do a few things for free, <laughs> but normally engagement of long term is under contract. I would foresee the check going to GDDC as the managers, and they then would manage. Again, hypothetically, ECIA. So funding would be contingent on their deliverable to our standards and GDDC standards would be what we want. Again, though, I this might have to go out for RFP. This might not to be as clean. We ARPA funds have restrictions on it as far as federal bidding guidelines. Yeah, I had a chance to speak with uh... GDC representative related to the, the city's plan, and it was quite extensive, or their research study, um, and it does contain a lot of their assets, and some of their assets are protected, such as, you know, water wells and sewer water infrastructure, those types of things. Um, we have probably less critical ones other than maybe our 911 system. Um, so that's, that's a reason why they weren't able to say, hey, here's the study, and they said, no, no problem, I get that. Um, I am not sure the benefit uh, we'll receive if once we gather all this data, to be honest with you. And so I've, I've, I've seen the, the spreadsheet that you've provided and understand now that there's a lot of lengths behind the cities. Ours would be more community based. So it would be in, in those communities of Piasta, Epworth, along with all of our assets, which maybe already have that understanding or mapping. So when you talk about the Farley shop and the West Campus and uh, remote sheds that we have we already have that information generally speaking i have a pretty good comprehensive list of the assets what i don't have is the next step below that is how do we gain access to them what's the nearest sure. 
point of presence pop. So there, there's a level deeper that we need to do. For our own internal ones. For our own internal okay. use, for but sure. this study would also then tie into those other critical assets. So whether it be a hospital in Dyersville, yes. whether it be a school, a community college in Piasta, so yes. on and so forth, right? That we yes. might be able to provide band broadband to someday in the future. And this is really what I did in my previous life, just with, you know, government assets, <laughs> water, sewer, roads, bridges. Um, and then we would map those as well. Um, I guess it convinced me why we, this, how valuable would this data be? And then who would we give it to? And what benefit would we have once we've completed this? I would need to work with the county attorney to make sure that we don't need to redact anything. I'm just, I don't think we would need to redact anything, but hypothetically, my intention would be this would not be a private document. This would be something that we would freely give to internet providers, to hospitals. Um, I'd like to see it as a living document that we don't just stick on a shelf and make it stale. We, this is something we have. As internet providers and as the county develops a more specific broadband strategy. Um, we will use this. I don't know how fast we can use it because we ourselves are not proceeding with any sort of a middle mile type infrastructure. But from a strategic standpoint, we have needs and we have assets that I wanna get conduit in five or two, somehow, some way. If we're not gonna build it ourselves, we're gonna need partners. Those partners are gonna need data. Those conversations go much faster if we can walk in and say, look, we have 62 assets. Here's everything that we know about them. Let's start talking about how do we do this as a partnership? You know, you own the conduit and fiber, you give us a couple strands as part of this build out. We've got three or four other schools in this room. I mean. We don't know what we don't know. And what I do know is that there's a lot of assets out there that need boots on the ground, walking the property, finding out, okay, so it says there's a clinic here. Okay, how do we get into this clinic? This clinic is scheduled to go away in three years. Okay, well, we probably don't need to spend a whole lot of time figuring that out. If we want to do anything more specific down the road with broadband, if we want to partner, if we want to do projects, if we want to do anything like that, we need data to start. And this is step one. I mean, gathering data. I mean, if, if there is no desire, no intention to ever have a more specific goal where we are actively involved, then no, uh, probably not. My hope is that the board will want to be more tangibly involved in some capacity. Um, as a total coincidence, I had an internet provider call me last week. I no, never heard of them, never, didn't even know they were in the county. Uh, they're pretty gung-ho, <laughs> they wanna talk to the board. Great, okay, I don't, know of any that ever directly talked to the board. So I'm have a follow-up call with them a week from now to learn more about them. Maybe they want to come present. Data's data. I mean, data has value. We will use this once we get it to figure out what step two, step three, step four will be. What would your comment be? You know, so you said, okay, I understand your government assets that the county owns, we manage. Um, you know, and hit our balance sheet and you know, hit all our GASB reports, blah, blah, blah. Um, what if somebody said, well, what's, why, why are you getting into the city's world or the community college's world or the hospital's world? Why do you feel or think that's a role the county should be responsible for trying to gather data and eventually have that data available? What, why is the county doing that? Why is the county paying for that? I would say we are doing that because they are within our borders and they are our, not to be, they're, they're our 
partners, they're our children, they are in the way, <laughs> they are in the path. Like some of those institutions may not have the organizational structure or the awareness that this is important information to get out there to the private sector, to other governments. Um, I could see Iowa DOT being interested in this. Alliant, I know, would be interested in this. I, is it a county responsibility? I would say yes. Um, I don't make county policy, but I would say yes. I mean, we should know what's within our borders. And if we can assist some of these smaller townships and smaller cities and gathering this data, I would say, yes, it's going to help them. It'll help us. It'll help the citizens that reside within it. Well, the master plan would help you in applying for state and federal grants, correct? It will be a component to get us at least to where we can start to make an application. It, it, it is a component of that, absolutely. I kind of see it as a kind of a, a virtual um, open or welcome sign that creating this plan allows uh, future partners to know that we're aware. Yeah. Then other discussions can follow from that. I, I'm going to support it because I, I don't, I think it's a very small ask to literally have anything that indicates that we're interested in this discussion. The point of clarification, so this would be, and I wasn't very good in English um, early on in my life. Uh, the comment of broadband master plan compared to what the city's doing, I don't believe is a fair term. My understanding from our brief conversation here and then looking at the deliverables from the city briefly is that this is really more data gathering, not a master plan. It's not a plan of what we should do. It doesn't list priorities, doesn't categorize, um, you know, highest priorities. It identifies assets out there. I'll pick on mine, NICC. So NICC built one, two, and three, their priority or interest in broadband, and then how potentially you could get to them, whether there's conduit already laid right up to the building and enters the building, or if it's a hard wall and you've got to figure out how to well, lay basically the other costs, and then potentially how important they feel or think it is to have broadband. So it's that for 300 or 500 assets out there. I would agree with that assessment. It is, it is so it's not, not a plan. It's not gonna, you give this to somebody to go like, wow, that's a lot of data. Wow, that's a lot of stuff out there. And the benefit, as you said, is hypothetically NICC uh, maybe gets a federal grant and they said, hey, county, would you partner with us? And I know you want to do this. And here's, oh, and I, we have all this information about how to get fiber to our buildings quickly and easily. That might speed up your grant, but it's not a plan, in my opinion, um, after understanding it better. It has value. Um, as you can hear by my questioning, I'm on the fence. It has value in your gathering data and, uh, you know, targeting and, you know, understanding what your assets are. Um, but it's, but it's not a plan. I, I would agree. It's not a plan. It, it is data gathering. It is, you, we would need this to even begin to have the conversations of a master plan. And a master plan can mean a lot of different things, but it is a, data gathering exercise that you can then start having hypothetical conversations much easier and faster. If you have a document like this and you have certain people in the room, you can start having intelligent conversations about, well, what if we did this or what if we did that? Whereas right now you can still do those, but you're, you're really shooting in the dark. You're, you're, you're using best guesses. You're using, you know, you're, you're really operating in the dark. So no, it is not a plan. It is the data that will someday allow us to make better decisions in the immediate term 
And if we want to develop a plan with partners or ourselves or whatever, then yes, we would need this. My desire for this is that it will help us make better decisions immediately when we start doing certain builds. Like I have certain conduit and fiber that are outside of ARPA that I'm working on and I will be bringing more of those to you at budgets. This will help clarify some of those decisions. So if we are gonna do like a half mile run or something like that, we can potentially have friends and partners along that path that may want to be, participate in that, but we've already identified them. Like it's, it, it's not an unknown, it'll be part of the proposal. Resolution reads, Dubuque County Broadband Master Plan with gap analysis not to exceed $50,000. Is that what this is? If you want me to bring the resolution back to remove the term master plan, I can. Um, it is primarily data gathering. So I took that from the ECIA and GDDC conversations. Happy to bring it back, but I can tell you from a it's not going to be a deliverable of a giant broadband master plan. It'll be a large data set that says NICC library, whatever it is, easy access, has vaults. They have two fiber providers already. This shed that has half million dollars of assets has no vault, no conduit, no internet provider, et cetera. So that's what it will be. If that is acceptable, great. Um, otherwise, I can bring it back. I would agree with Jay that it's not a master plan, so it's kind of a play on words there. So I'd prefer that it get brought back without the master plan on it. The board could also approve it pending changes as well, and we can edit that after the meeting and then have you sign that chair pot off. Another item I would be interested in adding um, is uh, is there going to be a GIS component of this and a GIS layer? So we'll have a spatial or map reference to where these assets are. I have not talked to GIS department on that, but that makes absolute sense. Um, in my mind, it was kind of there. I just hadn't had that conversation yet. But yeah, assuming we can, yeah, yeah I don't know why we wouldn't. I mean, make a layer that identifies the data from this exercise. I mean, unless we have individuals that don't want it, but it's all public data anyway, once we gather it, so certainly. Well, maybe the last point I'd have on this then is, is so, you know, maybe the desire of my, my colleagues was to have something more of a master plan in addition to possibly data gathering. I wouldn't be against that. And so if we felt that we could get some benefit out of these funds by having those things that you might include in a master plan, such as, one current state of play, overall desire, um, you know, high key visible assets. It would be you know a high level piece where this is going to be very detailed. Um, I'd, I'd be open to that. I don't know if you can do all that for fifty grand. I many times yeah, you know I for, don't think we could. For example, our comprehensive master plan for conservation costs about three times that at least, um, and was very exhaustive on all of our you know twenty one parks and facilities and what we should do and the improvement ideas for those a little, little more in depth, but uh, certainly a lot of benefit in those documents. I have interest in getting, if there's interest in having a more comprehensive plan and the cost is greater, I think we need to tell, tell Nathan what it is we want if we're not satisfied with what he's presenting. You know, my position has been that we need to be engaged in the conversation so that there's opportunities and we're prepared because we're not creating the opportunities we need to be prepared and look ready for those who want to engage us. So if there's other things you think are missing that we should be doing, like a <sighs> conservation plan, that level of study, whatever that is in the virtual world with broadband assets, let's, is this a time to do that? I'm certainly, that's why I mentioned it. So I, I would be interested in that. Um, I have talk to Nathan offline, so I'll repeat that in public. Um, I would be interested in a project. So that was my direct quote. So this wasn't high on my list. 
And so get a project with most likely a private provider and one that lines up benefit for the county and the community and that a private provider can get us there. So we don't have to do the entire lift ourselves and it benefits both the private sector and the, and the public sector. Challenging, but that's what I would like to do. Um, like we do in the roads and bridges departments each and every day. We build roads, well, we design and engineer and prioritize what road and bridges to do. And then we contract that with a private developer to do that. Um, that's what I would be interested in engaging related to broadband. Do that, do we need this analysis? No, I mean, the whole county. No, not for the whole county. We, we would need a slice of this. Um, to Supervisor Wickham's statement, yes, there, I have been reaching out. There are certain things that we could do with this. It's premature. I can't speak on it yet. It's been a week, but <laughs> we can, there are opportunities to do what you are requesting. Um, this hypothetically, if we had this document right now, it would reduce and accelerate some of those conversations. Do we need it to do a project? Do we need it to scope out two, three miles of underserved area? No, this is this is bigger than this. This is this is global. What what I believe Supervisor Rickham was talking about is, you know, give, give me a list of people that are in need that are underserved, and let's target them with partner or partners. And I will be am working on that. It's just. You know, it's only been a couple of days, so. I would be interested in funding something that is going to enable us to move towards federal and state grants for. If this, this, if this data thing is basically just gathering data that could help us, well, it could not help us also. If we need to get a, a master plan in place that we can apply for the state and federal grants, and it's going to cost us some more, I'd rather spend the money on that, getting a document that we can use to apply for these bigger grants. So I'm awesome. Great. I'm right there with you. I can tell you that there's no... We're talking a year and a half, two years down the road to develop some sort of a master partnership broadband map and all the money that's on the table right now, those grants are due in six, seven weeks. So this will help us go after grants. It will not hurt us. It will help us. We would need this data to develop anything further. So whether we make a resolution and vet and hire a company to help us build something bigger, right? I can come back with something in, in a few weeks to do that, but we would need this regardless. So we can start this process, get it going, potentially six to seven months from now. And then in parallel, we could start having conversations about a master plan, master map, or wait till this is finished. I'm open to all of it. I would just need to know what are the marching orders? Like, what, what is the board wanting me to focus on today? This is my focus right now. This is what I need, what I know is a tangible deliverable that will help us and help our partners. If we want to talk bigger picture, great. I can come back and we can see where that goes. I guess I'm a little confused on what this 50,000, who's getting the 50,000? Jay kind of asked you that and I didn't really catch the answer to that. So I don't want to reinvent the wheel with what has worked. But if I have to, because of ARPA guidelines, then sure, we'll do an RFP and we'll hire a vendor or people or peoples to go into the cities, gather the data. If I don't have to reinvent the wheel, like if, if I can just replicate the success the city of Dubuque has done, 
GDDC will be the project manager of this. They are the ones reaching out and having weekly, biweekly, two times a week, whatever it ends up being. And potentially ECIA would be the boots on the ground gathering the data. This is not just people at a computer searching Google or looking at maps. This is people going out into the field, walking into a facility, talking to the head of maintenance at that location, identifying the vaults, identifying what internet providers currently have fiber or currently have copper. So hypothetically, we would pay GDDC and GDDC would be a pass through because they're, they, they are doing that service as part of our subscription, as part of our partnership with them. They are not directly getting paid. I would need to work with the leadership team. My preference is GDDC would pay whoever the data gatherer is and not us, because then they can control that choke point. If it's not meeting their standards and our standards, then they can do whatever needs to be done to get a resolution to that. So high level. I wish to be prepared for federal grants and state grants. We need to be getting organized so that we can be an applicant at some time. That is, you are the IT director. I need you to tell me how and what to do to get ready for that. So if this is that step, I'm going to vote on this resolution. If there's a different step to get that ready and it has a different price tag, then I need you to come back. What I hear Supervisor Wickham talking about is another opportunity that is to targeted areas with, a, with potential private partners. I'm interested in that too, but I want to move forward. So I know we're not gonna get the grants for six weeks from now, but I don't think that this is the end of the discussion. Is it, that's just the current phase. But I do think as the leaders of Dubuque County, we need to try to get information gathered so that we're ready for the next step. And that appears to be missing. If the marching orders is to prepare to have a reasonable shot at state and federal grants, broadband related, this is one step towards that. No, my, my priority would be a project. I also would make a priority, a project. Yeah. If that opportunity comes, I don't see them as canceling each other. Honestly, I don't. I think that one works towards something that's that obviously they will be joined, but that is a different project. So this is what's before us today. Do you like the language as it currently reads, Supervisor Potoff, or is this, we would need this change somehow? Well, Kevin said we can approve it with the with the change and just I think uh, remove the master plan part, just a broadband gap analysis. Yeah. I, so, what? One, one moment. Yeah. Um, you know, we've had a lot of discussion on this. I think just to you know cross out a word and then say it's good. I, I wouldn't be satisfied. Um, I would like to have further understanding of. Who are those expenditures going to? You, you said kind of maybe ECIA and Greater Dubuque. I don't see either of those here today. I don't see any of them referenced in this resolution. Um, I just need a little more if, if I'm going to support this. Otherwise, I'll be voting no today. And it's rare that we have 30-minute conversations on these types of things and then say, sure, cross out a word and we're good. So I would ask my colleagues for a little more detail related to what actually this deliverable is and maybe some examples. I know you provided them last time, but they're not with the resolution. <coughs> the resolution specifically is not calling out vendors or <coughs> there would still be a contract that comes before the board. This is, this is to allocate the funds. Once the funds are allocated, then we can actually develop a contract for the board to review and sign. And if we need to make changes, et cetera, that this is, not, <coughs> unless I'm misunderstanding, I don't, think we would ever put that in the resolution. This is... But to Nathan's point, this is simply a resolution to allocate those funds. The board would have... Internally. Internally. Okay, so the board I, would have the ability to determine 
if the vendors met the needs that they wanted during contract time. I get it, but if we're, you know, we've said it like six times, talk calling out partners, then it's, you know, we shouldn't be surprised when they show up in a future document. So why not put them in the original document if that's the hard direction you're going? And then why aren't they here? Um, there's just a lot of detail on this stuff. You know, I don't want to go too far in the weeds, but, you know, Greater Dubuque is working with the FCC, right? You know, so the you know Federal Communications Commission to revise some of their maps so they can be then maybe possibly eligible for future federal funding. So this isn't really easy for the county we're in with the existing maps that the state and the feds have provided us. So we're already facing uphill battle is my understanding. And so if we feel or think we can kind of just have a study, collect our data, and then we'll be eligible for grants, I think that's naive. And so I'm questioning the validity of spending 50 grand. And that's why I keep hitting on it. Um, so I would maybe, maybe a work session on that, if I'm speaking out of school, would be helpful. Uh, I just am cautious that this 50 grand will be very good in data collection. And I spent my life in that, but not have the value. We collect data on all our bridges and we inspect them. Why? Because we have a direct funding source. We do the same thing with our roadways and we spend money to do that. And we do that because we have a direct funding source. We'll be collecting data on this, missing that direct funding source. It's gonna be very hard and, and probably far reaching is my assessment. I wish it was different because then I'd say, yeah, let's do it. <laughs> so this is the resolution like we've done everything in ARPA. This is the, the this is the base resolution that we've done for everybody. And then the contract is where we're actually going to see what it is that the applicant and the county come to terms onto what we're funding. People have stood many a time there and told us of great grand ideas and then we've given a dollar amount and now come the contracts. I hope that doesn't take us another six, nine months. But so that this is what you have in its very uh, simplified form doesn't concern me. We do need to have consensus, and that's what this is, to move forward to something. And I don't know what it is. If you said a, a broadband master plan is a lot of different things to a lot of different people. Does this meet what you think you're going to do with $50,000? Yes. I'm not, I don't know how much more we can help right now. We have to approve the idea of this to move forward to see more specifics. I don't think $50,000 is going to get us a large federal grant, but we're not even in the room and maybe this is the cost. I believe it's the cost to say that we want to be invited, right? We're doing some work. We're ready to be invited. Yeah. And if I may just say, I am not naive on the lift to get a federal broadband grant. It is, it would be an all hands on deck endeavor. Every, pretty much every department would have to contribute and help to get broadband grants from the federal government and from the state. This is one component. It is one component of many, many, many that we're gonna need. If, if the board wants to take a legitimate swing at those kinds of grants, we have a lot of work to do like we do there's no way to sugarcoat it because again as to your <laughs> to your point supervisor we don't have a direct funding stream we're competing against everybody and everybody who has done them successfully multiple times so this is just one component to get us on that path and as far as projects go yes there are partners the while middle mile is not proceeding those conversations, those relationships, those haven't stopped. And I'm going to continue that path and continue those developing that. And they have replied back to me that they want to continue this going forward. So we will come up with something for the board to review for a project that will help people. Do we need more discussion? I'm prepared to make a motion. I'm fine. Motion to approve the resolution. I will second it. A motion to second to approve the allocation. Uh, 
project funds for the uh, broadband gap analysis. Second, all in favor signify by aye. 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 All opposed, nay. Aye. Okay. Thank you. Nate. Thank you. Next, we have a resolution to approve the chairperson to execute a quit claim deed conveying the county's interest in the described property to Rodney and Peggy Ann Grant. Apparently, this was before the board in 2017, and uh, the paperwork never got filed properly or something. Good morning. This is the auditor. Uh, this is a resolution and supporting documentation from the treasurer's office. I will pull up the section that we're talking about, and then I'll put the memo on screen. The hatched area right there is the was the county-owned parcel that in 2017 we wished to and moved to convey to uh, the owners, uh, Rodney and Peggy Ann Grant, for one reason or another, uh, prior to most of our time in this room, uh, it was never recorded in the recorder's office. And when that was brought to our attention, uh, we prepared a new quit claim deed, rather the treasurer's office prepared a new quit claim deed and attached this memo. Um, the public hearing was held on May 22nd, 2017. So all requirements were met. And uh, this is just to get this piece of land of which Peggy and Rodney have a portion of their garage has been on the land, uh, just turned over to them. So cleaning up the one county owned parcel and a whole bunch to go, but we're, we're making strides. My questions of the story are, did we lose the quick claim deed? Did we never make a quick claim deed? And at the end of the day, it doesn't matter. Has the county attorney weighed in on this that we're, and that we're preparing a quick claim, quick claim deed based on something that happened many years ago? Uh, we did not consult the county attorney. However, the treasurer's office and the auditor's office routinely have prepared quick claim deeds. Um, so this is well within our wheelhouse. The, uh, there's no limitation on when a public hearing ends. Mm -hmm. Uh, so as far as our office is concerned, all the steps were met. And this is simply shoring up the fact that we are not aware how it never made it to the recorder's office, but it was never recorded. Maybe there was a problem at the county attorney's office with the quick claim deed that was prepared or something. Well, uh, quick, we wouldn't send a quick claim deed through the county attorney's office to begin with. So more than likely, it was either left on someone's desk or never sent from a department to another department or never uh uh, never completed. We do have the minutes from that board meeting that it was approved and the intention of the board was to have this go through. Um, it simply never made it from point A to point B to actually be recorded. And they did not pay us any compensation. I'm sorry? Did they pay any compensation? one dollar. Yeah, my, my memory is this is, you know, we had a small initiative to attempt, mainly in the city of Dubuque, to clean up various parcels that the county probably has inherited through delinquent tax. Right. And then the city would be like, hey, who's mowing the yard? Hey, who's shoveling the walk? Hey, how would you like to spend some money on the sidewalk? And we'd be like, what, what parcel? And this would one of them. And so then this property only right next to it be like, sounds good, I'll take it. One buck, I'll do all the things you mentioned and the county won't have to worry about it. And we said, thank you very much. And I think I did my job that day. And this is uh, the main this is the main impetus for for this one. And then there there are going to be a couple more coming down the yeah. pipeline in the coming months because there is a liability that the county holds with some think, of these city parcels. I think um, we own twenty or thirty parcels within the city of Dubuque. I think it's more than that. Actually, than we have an extensive it's, spreadsheet. And and the issue we run across is as the city identifies that you need to pay to clear this land, you need to shore up these deficiencies. It, it's a liability on our books, and there are neighbors who more than likely are willing to purchase this land. So Grub parcels. So this happens to be one in a residential. Some of them are actually like on a little slope of a hill that nobody wants, can't build. Tops of bluffs are very common. Yeah. You know, so areas yeah, where you can't the rocks are gonna fall off and stuff. Anyway, um, yeah, I think we did everything we we should have done on this with the exception of recording it. Correct. So I will make a motion to approve. Second. I have a motion and a second. Uh Approve the chairperson to execute a quit claim deed conveying the county's interest in uh, above property to Rodney and Peg Peggy Ann Grant. All in favor signify by aye. 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 Thank you. Bye, John. Kevin. Uh, communications. Uh, 
where the board will receive and file without taking action. First is the Historic Preservation Commission res resignation. Sandra Larson is resigning from that board. Uh, Consolidated Dyersville Economic Development District Amendment and the Cascade Urban Renewal Area Amendment. Any discussion on any of those? Uh, I will second that. I have a motion and a second to receive and file. All in favor, signify by aye. 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 I have appointments, open vacancies for information only. To the personnel requisitions, the budget analysis position. Motion to approve the motion um, for the permanent full-time budget an analyst. I will second. We have a motion and a second to approve the personnel requisition for the permanent full-time budget analysis. All in favor signify by aye. 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 All opposed, nay. Nay. Next, we have a motion to approve the personnel requisition for temporary election personnel. And that's... These are our standard uh, temporary staff that we hire. Uh, prior to each election. Uh, we'll be looking at keeping them on for uh, 16 weeks maximum, and they'll start uh, later this month, I believe. I will second that. I have a motion and a second to approve the personnel requisition for the temporary election personnel. All in favor, signify by aye. 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 Carried. Next, we'll go to public comments. At this time, anyone may address the board on matters which are a concern to that person, which are not agenda, agenda items. Please go to the podium, state your name and home address. Please be aware that the board is limited in their ability to respond to such inquiries. And I will code prohibits the board from deliber deliberating or acting on items not appearing on the agenda. Individual remarks are limited to three minutes. Do we have anyone in chambers wishing to address the board? Seeing no one in chambers, do we have anyone online, Kevin? We have no one indicating they would like to speak. Okay. Do we want to go into a work session or do we need I will to make a motion to recess for five minutes, please. Okay. Have a motion and a second to recess for five minutes. All in favor signify by aye. 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 We'll return at approximately 10 or 7.
Ready? Call the Board of Supervisors back into session. Uh, we'll go to our 915 work session. We're running a little behind discussion and possible action with Mental Health and Disability Services of East Central Region regarding the update of the 2080 agreement between Dubuque County and the East Central Region. We have May Hinchin here for that. Morning. Good morning, May. But, but there you go. There we go. Now I'm getting right. I'm on. Now we hear you. Thank of the 2080 you. agreement between Dubuque County and the Mental Health and Disability Services of the East Central Region. The 2080 agreement revisions this time around were primarily rated, related to Senate File 619, which was signed in the legislative session last year that changed our funding system from um, county contributions, county property taxes to a state funded system. So I'll go through the changes in the 2080 agreement as quickly as I can. And certainly when you have questions, you can interrupt me or if you'd like to wait till the end, that's fine as well. So the first change was it is in section two. In section two, we used to have the bill number that um, kind of governed the 2080 agreement. And instead we took that out and made it the Iowa code section. So code section 331.390 is our um, the governing code section for mental health and disability services regions. And Kevin, if you can scroll to um, section 3.5. So 3.5 is a brand new section. What this talks about is the, the two preceding sections, if the region dissolves or if a county withdraws from the region, the options for counties if they withdraw from the region are to solicit membership with another region. Um, counties have to be congruent with a region where they want to apply to enroll. If this, this happened a few years ago in, a, in another region, but if a county wanted to leave a region and the region that they applied to become part of turned them down and they could not, they did not feel like they could stay with their current region, the Department of Human Services has the authority to assign a county to a region. The Department of Human Services can say, too bad, stay with the region that you're in, work it out, or to the region who turned them down, you must take them. So section 3.5 is about that reassignment. If the Department of Human Services has to um, do that, then the county still has the responsibilities, <clears throat> excuse me, to, to for the remainder of the fiscal year until the reassignment takes place. Um, if you could scroll to 4.1, I'm sorry, 4.3C, just the next page, thank you. <coughs> Excuse me, I sat there for so long without a tickle in my throat, now I've got one. Um, in this section, we allow for governing board members to be electronically present to vote. We, currently, we previously did not allow board members to be electronically present, but gosh, we've learned some lessons in the pandemic and needing to use Zoom for meetings. So as long as we have a quorum of board members that are in attendance in person, then board members can be present by electronic means without any penalty. <clears throat> All right, um, the next one is 4.5A E. So, Yep, right there. The bottom there of page seven, where it says, there will be a memorandum of understanding between the governing board and the individual county boards that used to say 2080. We just changed it to memorandum of understanding. And if you remember, you signed that MOU last January. So it's putting into language the uh, practice that we have done. And then next is 4.6A. In the bottom of that paragraph, it says, um, if a committee member on any of our committees has been designated um, to serve and is removed by the governing board, then the advisory boards shall designate a new director to serve um, in the position that was vacated. So say, for example, we have a liaison from 
the Regional Governing Board to the Children's Advisory. We have a liaison from the Children's Advisory to the Regional Governing Board. At any time, if the Regional Governing Board said we would prefer not to have this person be a liaison either way any longer, then the Children's Advisory would appoint a new board. Or a new representative, sorry. Uh, um, and then we're going to go all the way, Kevin, to section six, six, which is finances. That first paragraph or that first section A, the first sentence is all new. So the region shall maintain a combined mental health and disability services fund to deposit funds under this code section, which was what was indicated by Senate file 619 last year. Um, for all of our state and local, uh, state, federal, and other funding as directed to the region. So we have always had a regional services fund. We allowed in the East Central region for counties to maintain funds locally, but we had the regional services fund. There were um, a region or two who didn't have one. So that language was put in the bill to ensure that all regions would have a regional services fund. And this is... Um, that language was at the request of the Department of Human Services. So we also in this section completely took out um, the beginning of section B, talked about county member contributions. So that was the property taxes that county, each individual counties were required to contribute. So now counties are not required to contribute those dollars anymore and we took that completely out. And just at the top of the next page in section C, um, any interest that is earned on regional funds under the control of the fiscal agent should accrue to the regional fund. In other words, if we have any interest in the regional fund, we can't assign it back to counties. We also took out language, a D here, that talked about counties being able to maintain um, fund balance in their local funds. So that is no longer allowed by law. So we took that section out. And the process for annual independent audit, it is now required by law that we have to provide a, a copy to the Department of Human Services. It's public record anywhere. Anyway, they could have gone to see it on the state auditor's website, but we have to put it in there that we have to provide a copy for them. There was a section 6.4 that also talked about con county contributions that we deleted completely because counties no longer contribute. And that is it for the changes that we made this time around to our 2080. It has been reviewed twice by county attorneys. Um, our process had been that our regional operations committee suggested, met with the Department of Human Services and got their recommendations on suggested language change. And then we drafted a, um, an agreement. We sent it out to county attorneys who gave their input. We made some changes. I think we've taken it to the regional governing board twice, the first time and then to county attorneys and then now back to the regional governing board. The regional governing board has approved this 2080 agreement and we ask for individual counties to approve it. Sorry, it was sent to county attorneys again after last month when the regional governing board approved it. Now um, asking county boards to approve it so that on Wednesday when we have our regional governing board meeting, Supervisor McDonough as our liaison to the regional governing board can sign the, um, the resolution that's all together with everyone's signatures. So questions, comments on the 2080? Do you have any engagement with our county attorney about the documents in the yep. form? Yeah, um, um, CJ May did respond and gave um, a couple of um, you know, technical, legal input suggestions in that first round. Um, and I think in the second round, we just got to, okay, <laughs> back. Go ahead, Jim. So a couple thoughts on this. So uh, 3.5. Uh, talks about reassignment and the yep. language of responsibilities or contributions required. So that brought me to my first question is, 
what are our responsibilities and what are our contributions? And if I can get a list of those, that would be helpful. Um, the only times it's referenced in the document. Reassigned, you, you don't get to back out on your responsibilities or contributions, which I'd want to know what they are. Um, I think I know, but if you could provide that list, that would be very helpful. Yep. And then there's reference to a director and a CEO. Is that the same position? Yeah, um, there are directors of disability services. And by law, we are required to have a director of disability services assigned to each county. By law, we are not required to have one physically located in each county, but we are required to have one assigned. Our region is big enough that we have one, okay. you know, located in each county. So um, different from the CEO. I thought that, but I want to make sure I got clarity on that. And yeah. so as the CEO, um, I understand you report to the board. Is there any language in this document that states where your employment status should be or is or Yes. By state law, if you could direct me to that, would be very helpful. State law does not address employment. <clears throat> okay. It's up to each region to decide their employment um, structure. So that would be. Under 4.5A, the um, regional administrative entity. And then we are in um, section E of that again, towards the end of that. It says staff shall include one or more coordinators of mental health and disability services or one or more coordinators of children's behavioral health hired by their respective county for personnel, payroll and benefit purposes and being accountable to their particular board of supervisors for business unrelated to the East Central region. For job duties performed on behalf of the region, service coordinators shall be accountable to the East Central Region CEO and Governing Board. That document pertain to the CEO and the coordinators or just the coordinators? That is the coordinators. Let me go back to the CEO section. Yeah, that, that's, that's where I'm kind of just wondering if there's any language in here that states that Board of Supervisors or County should be the employer of record. Just looking for clarity on that piece. Yep. At the in um, paragraph A, the last sentence says the chief executive officer shall serve at the pleasure of the governing board and shall be under its direct supervision, evaluation, and control. It does not address county employment there. Has that been direct? Has that been discussed at the the board at all? Either you or Supervisor McDonough. I'm just sure. You know, so you're you're a new county employee, and I'm happy with that. Um, prior to all the changes. And so now, I'm, now that we've had changes, um, that the way it should be or prescribed to be or by law. Sure. And let me, let me answer that in a little bit broader sense, Supervisor Wickham. Um, there are regions in the state who have changed their employment structure. Um, we have one region in the state who has become their own 501c3 in which they you know, enrolled as their own agency and they um, they got IPERS and, you know, they provide insurance and payroll and all of those it's types of things. It's a separate entity. It's a separate energy and entity. So that region, right, they have a, a different organizational structure and none of the employees are employed by a county. We have one, two, three, going on four regions who have chosen to move all of their employees into one single county. And so, for example, if we decided to do that, any of our employees in the nine county area would become Dubuque County employees. And so then it's one employee handbook, one policy, you know, one, one set of rules, personnel, all of those things. We have discussed this at great length <laughs> this year at the regional governing board level, um, twice in public meeting for as formal as agenda items and once as a work session. And it has been um, a resounding decision by the regional governing board that they don't wanna change our employment structure at this time. 
that they would like to continue to have county, um, all staff be county employees. In fact, I met with Johnson County last week and um, their point on it is if we were to change that structure, the um, amount of increase in personnel expenditures, you know, HR expenditures, those types of things would be significant and they would take money away from services, you know, that we're doing to the, to the people that we support across our nine county area. So Johnson County is very very firm <laughs> in their opinion on that. Um, the other counties, you know, like I said, and Supervisor McDonough, you can add in here, but as well, but, yeah. they are all firm. I have uh, advocated uh, the position that Stella has asked me to look at. The auditor has asked me to look at. I am, sit on the finance committee for the region. I have advocated that there. Talk to colleagues. Um, and Dubuque County stands alone on the idea that employees would be other than county employees or that resources would be directed. This standalone idea, which I think many of us in this room think is a great idea, has zero support from the rest of the, the, the region. So, um, and, and their, I think their, their positions um, obviously are persuadable to each other and they have a combined history that I do not. I am one of the newest members to the governing board and they will tell me the history of things and such and and that's I'm, I've not been able to find any ally on that. So I think one um, maybe positive movement that we've talked about recently and we actually just talked about it last month is you're right, you know, things have changed. It's the county doesn't contribute property tax dollars anymore, it's state funding. So is there a burden on any single county? So one of the things that, that the finance committee will be working on and bring forth is some uh, consistency to how we, how we factor administrative and occupancy expenses. So some counties in our region don't charge any administrative and occupancy expenses to the region. Some do, and they do it factored on this, and some do it factored on this, and some do it factored on something way over here. And so we know, you know, we know that there is additional burden on the counties to have the staff. And so we want the region to reimburse the counties for that. And we would like to have a consistent formula, a consistent way of doing that. So, and I don't, I don't know yet, the finance committee will be working on it, but is it, there are, accounting measures to figure this out, right? Methods, um, square footage, you know, maybe based on per capita, maybe based on the number of staff, right? In Dubuque County, we have four staff. In Johnson County, they have six staff. You know, in Buchanan County, they have five staff. So you're on my point. So yeah. One of my questions, so how many employees are there at the region? And 34. 34. Not counting mental health advocates. 34 <laughs> and... They are represented from all nine counties? Correct. 34 in place. Okay. So we, you know, I mean, like, we get it, right? And we want counties to be fairly compensated for the work of the auditor's office to, you know, process payroll, those types of things. And so we want to, we want to have a consistent measure approved and implemented this year. Thank you for that. I have yeah. a few more yeah. questions unless somebody else wants to jump in. I am, I'm delighted you're a county employee. I mean, it, I, I believe it is to our citizens' benefit that the CEO of this region comes from the Dubuque Community School District, that is your experience, and that you operate out of our Dubuque County area. I think that is a benefit to us. So I don't want to have that be overlooked here. I think it's a benefit to all the stakeholders I work with who who feel the same. I think it it certainly, you know, when, <coughs> when I look more from an objective standpoint, um, I feel like, you know, I have relationships in Dubuque County <coughs> different than the previous CEO did, and she lived in Lynn County. So she had relations in Lynn County that I don't probably have. So, I mean, I it does impact a little bit, yeah, relationship-wise. Statewide, remind me again, how many regions are there? 14. 14, and not responsible for all 14. Thank heavens. But generally, yeah. <laughs> um, 
would it be fair to say there's 14 different 2080s? Does every region have a different <coughs> government agreement or a different agreement if they're not actually? They all are 2080s. And yes, I would say there there's some there's some similarities because we share amongst them, but they're all different. And the regions have that discretion Correct. amongst their board. Okay, I'm starting to figure this out. So that's good. Um, is there anything in the new law that requires board of supervisors involvement? So for example, the first, I forget the exact name, judicial district or that I used to serve on, you serve on, that was a state code that board of supervisors shall serve on this, even though the funding comes from the state. Is there any language that says that, that yes. the board of supervisors shall do this or a county shall do that? Yes. Um, uh, anything that's referenced in the 2080? That's the, the liaison from the local board to the regional governing board. So the regional governing board shall be made up of a member of the board of supervisors from each of the counties. Some regions, especially the smaller regions, actually have two members of the board of supervisors serve on the regional governing board. We just have one. Um, we also shall have an adult with lived experience. We shall have a parent of a child with serious emotional disturbance. We shall have an education representative. And those are all voting members. We have two ex officio non-voting members. That is a provider of adult MHDS services and a provider of children's services. Is any of those shells in this agreement? Yeah. And specifically, I'm interested in the supervisor yep. county piece. Yep. 4.1. A talks about the supervisors. 4.1 A. Thank you. Thank you. Thank You're you. welcome. 4.1 A. One supervisor from each member in the region shall be appointed as a director. Okay. So we're agreeing to that. Or two each member shall select a structure. And the children's advisory or the children's liaison, Melissa O'Brien. The, she's the education. Education. Yes. And then we have a parent liaison too that we need to check okay. in with. Right. But we do have Dubuque County, rural Dubuque County. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Dubuque School District. Yep. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Have any others? Um, Yeah, I would, would like to understand the going back to my first question, our responsibilities and contributions. So those two jumped out at me. In this document are separate. What are our responsibilities? What are our contributions? Specifically the contribution piece. Yeah, the, usually you think of that as financial. Right. <laughs> yeah, it's not it's not financial anymore, but contributions as far as space for the office staff, and that is specifically listed in the MOU that you signed back in January. That we that each county provides um, office space, vehicles if necessary. Um, I can't remember all those things. Those are the contributions. They're reimbursed by the region, right? But it's just the goodwill of like, hey, we have space. A lot of our coordinators are located in a county building, in the courthouse or another building owned by the county, which again goes to back to that discussion of how do we adequately reimburse counties for their contribution that way. Short questions. You kind of hit on one of mine. Uh, I would like to see all the employees under one county because it is, I don't, I just don't like the way this is. Your W County and you got other ones different. It's like they should all be under ECR as far as I'm concerned because it, there's too much confusion as to who's where, what, when, and who's taking care of what and you know, employee rights, benefits, whatever. Uh, obviously the East Central region does not want anything to do with that from what you're saying. Right? At this time. We're not gonna say we're not gonna bring it up again. <laughs> if I, I might just say, so when we think about, you know, when the state changed the funding, we're all, newer members to the board. Jay, obviously you have the seniority here, but 
to us, it was like, oh, we don't need fund 10, then maybe we don't need to have payroll. We can just streamline the region and the region can be, maybe you and I talked about this more than a year ago, the region could be its own employer. And that had discussion. There was a lot of discussion about that because our thought was let's get a, a nonprofit in charge with this responsibility. And then when the state maybe doesn't keep its promise in the future, we're not going to be wondering how do we now fill services, benefits. So that's, you know, the backfill was a good example of that, right? Where now all of a sudden it goes away. Interestingly enough, one of the longest term members and one of the longest serving uh, supervisors, um, Shirley Helmrichs from Delaware said, Anne, I know they're going to break their promise someday. And for that reason, I don't want to go through the administrative time to create an entity that's going to be meaningless in five years, six years, seven years. And she's very persuasive. Delaware County has changed how they provide mental health services no fewer than five times. And so she's saying this is just going to be the sixth change. They're very disruptive. And it takes away from providing benefits to citizens. When we are engaged in this creation of a large administration, it takes time away from the very necessary, urgent work that we need to do in our counties. So that's just kind of the two different extremes of looking at what you see the goal to be. I don't disagree with the ultimate goal, but it's not going to happen now. It, it may come in over time. We may have new board members join. Yeah. Several of we are going to have, yeah, yeah, we're going to have all folks for sure. Yeah, we'll have three new for sure, and they potential to have seven to more. Come up with uh, reimbursement. Yeah, possibly. Uh, I, I hundred percent agree. Yep. Spent at the county level here, in Kevin's office all over. You know, yep. paying bills and doing this and. And Phil everything. and I've talked about that. Uh, We've talked about how and, aggressive are we with our um, allocation and our occupancy. And you feel that we're, we do charge occupancy. We have an annual cost allocation plan uh, done by an outside third party. And that's what we use to charge back to the region. So it's got occupancy, um, personnel, uh, auditor expenses, IT expenses all built into it. Good to know. Like I said, not all counties in the region have previously done that. So, I mean, certainly the, the regional governing board hasn't at any time in this last year since Senate file 619 passed been like, oh, well, we'll just rely on the good nature of the counties. You know, it, there have been really active discussions about how do we reimburse the counties? It's it's state money. So how do we use that to make sure that the counties are adequately reimbursed for the effort that they put forth? And I think Supervisor Potoff, Programmatically, the Regional Governing Board asked me to help them understand a little bit more about what each of the coordinators do and what their job is and how does that look and, you know, where do they overlap because there is a lot of overlap. And I shared a, a document with the Regional Governing Board at our retreat that said, you know, here are all the duties of the region and here are all the, the coordinators. And here's where they have primary responsibility, maybe secondary or tertiary responsibility to help them understand a little bit more like what everybody does and how it all works together. So programmatically, I think we're, we're working towards a little bit more clarity. Um, as far as like personnel type issues, I think we have some space yet to improve that. And, and honestly, didn't come up in this iteration of the 2080, but I think this is, so this is for sure the second, if not the third 2080 in the almost three years that I've been with the region. So there'll be another. <laughs> so the 34 employees, who do they report to and who's responsible for their outcomes and results? Yep. So the way that the 2080 reads is for their work to the region that they're responsible ultimately to me and to the governing board for their work to their counties, they're responsible to their county board of supervisors. So let me give you an example. In Delaware County, Peggy does VA and GA. 
I take that back. Peggy doesn't do GA. She does VA. So 15% on that MOU that we signed in January, 15% of her salary is allocated to VA. So that's her work to the county. For all of her VA stuff, she is accountable to her board of supervisors. In Dubuque County and Cameron Williams, hers is 20% substance use. For her substance use work, 20% of her work, she's accountable to you. 80% of her salary is paid by the region. That's her regional work. She's accountable to myself and the regional governing board. We have um, so many different variations of that. You know, our regional social workers are primarily 100% region. Our secretaries, clerical staff is, I would say 80% of them are 100% region. Our coordinators, I would say 20% of them are 100% region. Oop. Probably goes to Supervisor Potoff's you know, point or question related to should they all be under one umbrella. When you split responsibilities and let's say split allegiances um, and or reporting authorities, uh, that can be very challenging. <laughs> Very challenging to maintain a team and maintain good outcomes would be mm -hmm. my experience. Mm -hmm. um, when it works, it works. And then when it doesn't, it is a challenge. I would like to see examples where it has worked. I have I mean, government split responsibilities amongst nine counties and 34 employees. Um, that'd be pretty challenging um, to, to get everyone, quote, rowing at the same time. Um, so yeah, I would also be skeptical of the, the relationship and the format of how our region uh, set this up. Um, I, I do believe it was the right move for the state to remove this from local property tax dollars. I um, felt that it should be a general services uh, allocation from the state. And so uh, having mixed responsibilities and mixed employment in with various counties and various regions, I think would be very challenging. Therefore, I wouldn't be interested in setting it up. So um, I would be interested in, in the, the county attorney's written response to this 28E. So that may be a comment to you and to, to my board members. There's, I would like to see our county engineers, excuse me, I say engineers, our county attorney's uh, written response to the 28E where he felt there would be liability or potential things we should be aware of. I have not seen any of that. I, I trust that you worked with him and talked to him, but I would like to see a response. Were you involved him. in that? Did he CC you? No. Mm -mm. Yeah, I no. believe he CC'd me. I can check with our coordinator yeah. who has um, facilitated the development of this 2018. Well, I'd like to hear from the county attorney. So I'm requesting the county attorney's direct communication, whether it be written yeah. or in presence related to this 2080 before we approve it. I think that would be standard. The 2080 is it, set to be signed on Wednesday. And the county attorney has given his approval. I mean, it, certainly we can, I, I can get it, but. I pre appreciate your, your relaying that message, but you know, it's usually good to hear directly from the county attorney or have his opinion directly represented. Normally, what we do on contracts, and this is a big one. This is a, us being part of a big region and, and a lot of uh, important services. So, I mean, we normally do that in other agreement. Oh, I agree with that. Uh, we have the county and, and that's, to that's, Don't sure. we normally do that? I mean, that's what we normally I do. I always we ask just, that, and yeah, I have asked yeah. that in this case as well, and and that's why I've I've asked what's been the county attorney's input. The county attorney has seen these documents, has given you comment on the first draft, an okay on the second draft. I'm comfortable with that. That has been the interchange that's been, that has taken place. Other counties have county attorneys that are on Zoom calls and Johnson County attorney gives you extensive instructions and Lynn County, it, it's based on- And some county attorneys haven't responded. Exactly. Yeah. And those are other counties. I'm not yeah. responsible for those and nor did the citizens of Butte County elect me to be responsible for other counties and their county attorneys, but I believe we should have a written or verbal acknowledgement from our county attorney related to this 2018, don't you? 
I think CJ has seen it. You said yes. seen it he twice. Oh, we're it hearing from our we're hearing from the CEO. I'm asking you to hear from the county attorney. I'm hearing it from Ann also that CJ has seen it. And, I think we should and hear from our county attorney directly, either in writing directly to the board or in person. He hasn't done any of the other. He hasn't done. The, he's never come in here to talk to us about the MOU or the other 2080 agreements. Never would be pretty strong of word. Um, that's fine. If you guys don't want to do it, that's that's fine. Just a fine request. Oh, I would definitely agree. I want the county attorney's opinion, but may as this is our first work session on this, right? It's the first time we've been exposed to this document at a board, right? So I'm hopefully I'm not being unreasonable. So granted, I did get it on Wednesday or Thursday, so I was able to read it. So I've had a couple of days, but you know to bring this in front of us here's your first work session here's your first review of it in public oh by the way approve it and sign it that's your only choice I, that's a tough position to put elected officials in your your regional governing board representative has seen it probably four times so I, yeah granted and we have a, so maybe a dilemma of a three-person board um she doesn't brought in bring it to me and say hey you know Take a look at this and please agree on it. That would be probably against state code. And so that doesn't happen. So this is our first time in public reviewing this document. And all I'm asking is for the county attorney's opinion and review. Are there are there um, provisions in this revision of the 2080 that are questionable or offensive to Dubuque County? I, because everything else in there stayed the same. I asked like six times or three times, sorry, exaggerate. What are our responsibilities? What are our contributions? Those in writing. And those are very, in your MOU. Those would be very important to see. Do we have the MOU? In front Find of it us? in January. Been a bit. So it is. I, I know. Appreciate yeah. it. I don't do this like you do every day of the year. So, um, so you can point to the MOU, but I haven't had that in my packet or presented to me. So I'm not trying to be difficult and just saying what are our processes. But I will defer to my colleagues on how they want to for how they want to proceed. Professor Potoff, you frequently are on Zoom at those regional governing board meetings. I know when I look up at the big screen, I see you there. Um, you probably have seen or heard some of this discussion mm -hmm. over the last month, so you have that benefit. Right. I understand Jay's uh, concerns with the contract. We did just get it, but uh, I'm comfortable with uh, May as a CEO and uh, Anne as being the liaison to the board that this has gone to CJ. He has commented on it. Granted, it wasn't directly to me or to you. Uh, but or, I will... or to me. <laughs> or to me. Or, or to he you. responds to, uh, to the person who requested, and that has right. been May. So, so none of us as a board of supervisors have heard from the county attorney, and this is our first review of the 2080s. So in the future, I would request from the region a little more time, a little more consideration, maybe one more work session. One of the benefits of you being in here in Dubuque County should be that grace, I'm hoping. And so that's what I'm asking. It just puts us in a tough position. Day one, one review, 45 minutes, your only option is to agree because it's being signed next week. That's a tough position to put us in. So if I could get a little more time for this communication and a little more time to maybe resolve past, you know, 45 minutes, some of my questions, that would be helpful. What were your questions again? What are our duties? Or I don't know if it matters if we're going to agree today. So if, you, if we have two yes votes, it doesn't really matter if we're going to agree always, on it. We have always <clears throat> held matters. When a supervisor raises a question of legal counsel, I've always held for that. So there won't be a signature from Dubuque County on Wednesday. Is that okay? What happens then? I mean, I can have that email, I'm sure, from CJ forwarded to you within a couple hours, but I don't know if you want to approve it pending. Uh, I, I don't know. Um, that's for That's your process for you to decide um then it would if if supervisor mcdonough is not able to sign it wednesday at the meeting then it won't be able to be submitted to the secretary of state's office as an official record until at which time supervisor mcdonough could sign it so we could put it on our agenda for next monday take action then i would sign it locally and then it could go 
yeah if you yeah um the the problem always that yes absolutely the problem always is trying to get everybody together for the signature but if we have eight signatures then i feel comfortable bringing the document back with me um because jan heideman is the one who will submit it to the secretary of state's office but we can work that out would make me be the yeah. last signature yeah, and as long as we have the other eight, that wouldn't be a problem. I think the last time I drove it around some and Jan drove it around because we didn't have an opportunity where everybody was together. Table until next week then. I'm not gonna make the motion to table. Oh. I'm comfortable. Yeah, and like I said, I don't want to be unreasonable. I don't want eight other counties to be, oh my God, to be a county is unreasonable. But maybe this is a time, if you are local, if you are the CEO, and that is a benefit, that maybe we can get some further review of important items prior to expecting a approval of those documents. And that, that's what I'm asking. That's a, an improvement point. But I will defer to my colleagues. I don't plan to vote against this. Um, but would you like to do Supervisor Wickham? Would you be are you looking to table? Are you looking I, to approve? Uh, my requests are for <laughs> for the, the county attorney to, to give us his opinion on this to the board. And uh, specifically, I would ask him same questions I've asked the CEO, what are our responsibilities and what are our contributions? I have another agenda item and that is to update the priority initiatives. Um, if you would take a recess, I can make a phone call and have that email sent to you probably by the time I'm done. Um, well, I, I'm sure he's going to have difficulty off the cuff in that no, email no, no, responding no. to my responsibilities and contributions. Oh, well, that would be, again, finding that MOU from January. I mean, we could pull that up as well and have that sent in. I would advise you two to proceed as you would like to lead. My requests are just that. The requests are not hard. Is that CJ right there? Oh, well, there you have it. <laughs> A bit busy today. Possible to break or somewhere. You could just verify that he it's in the document. That's I can't I hear you. <laughs> well, I would like to proceed. I mean, if you, if you, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not doubting that this uh, agreement was, you know, made in in haste. I'm not, you know, doubting that. Uh, you know that somebody's trying to pull one over and give you a county right just yeah. normally you know if it's a important we maybe could have a one or two work sessions prior to that and so it doesn't put us in the position to read the document on thursday and then you have to approve it on monday with no other recourse other than we're, we have to approve it fact is i won't um join in approval of this when one of my colleagues wishes to have a legal, uh, the county attorney address us here present, because if he has concerns about a legal matter, I believe that the county attorney needs to address that. So this says it's possible action, but I'm not, I have no interest in tabling. I'm not making that motion. Someone wishes to do that. At this point, there's no action taken. It's there, there doesn't action. need to be a motion to table. It's, it's possible action. So if no action is taken, no action is taken. Do you want um, May to see if she can provide you the documentation you're asking for? Of course. <laughs> and would, can we recess for five minutes and that would secure that for you? Of course I would take it, but once again, your, your expectation is you're gonna feed this to me and I will say yes. And so, um, you know, giving time to review important documents and have discussion, I think is important. So uh, by all means, if you have the information that I'm asking for, the review of the county attorney, I will take that whenever it's available. Great. 
hear about the strategic plan. So as you know, the East Central Region has a five-year strategic plan. We have five, five years and we have five very broad goals. The goals are intentionally broad so that we can work towards them over the course of five years. Each year in May, I ask the Regional Governing Board to approve what we call the priority initiatives. We picked May as our schedule for this because um, conceivably the legislator is wrapped up by the fourth week in May. That's when the Regional Governing Board meeting is. I'm 0 for 3 on that. In 2020, they had a truncated session. Last year, they went till June. This year, they were done about three days after the Regional Governing Board meeting. But we like to kind of know where we're at um, as far as a legislator, if anything changes when we set our sights on the next fiscal year. So I always consider these priority initiatives, our marching orders, our action steps of how we'll get to those five broad goals. We have three different tiers here. They're priority tier one, two, and three. I'd like to point out that things are in priority tier priority tier two and three, not necessarily because they're less important, but sometimes the work is someone else's and the region is just partnering on that work. Sometimes something has to happen in priority tier one before it can happen. So we move it, you know, there might be two that are related to the same thing. One has to happen before the other can. So we put that in tier two. And then sometimes work might be um, primary work or tier one in the previous fiscal year. And now in this current fiscal year, it's continuation of that work. So that's why it would be in tier two or three. So again, it's not necessarily saying that these things are less important, but just kind of how the work plays out sometimes. So the things in priority tier one, um, we want to make sure that we're a good partner with the Department of Human Services. We have a performance-based contract that the region has signed with the Department of Human Services. So we have to make sure that we're meeting the requirements of that contract, as well as we have fiscal responsibility um, with state dollars. So as you know, the end of FY22, we were required to reduce our regional fund balance to 40%. At the end of fiscal year 23, we have to reduce our fund balance to 20%. So we need to really keep our eye on our budget this year. We have an aggressive budget, again, because we have 20% of that fund balance that we have to reduce. Um, if you look at our balance sheet, our budget for FY23 is a little over 29 million, and the amount of revenue that we're getting from the state is 22.1 million. So it looks like we're deficit budgeting because we do have to reduce our fund balance from 40% to 20%. Um, the other thing with that, with the fiscal responsibility, is our responsibility to our counties. And so we signed the MOU that we will um, provide a quarter's worth of the administrative and occupancy expenses to the county ahead of the quarter rather than behind how we used to do it. So when we had Fund 10, you know, each county would pay staff and do all those administrative expenses and then submit a report to the region and get reimbursed for it. Um, although we know our counties are, are generous and, and want to work with the region, we don't expect them to float, if you will, the region. So the money goes to the county now prior to the beginning of the quarter rather than after. So just want to make sure you're feeling comfortable with how, how all that played out. I know we had a couple things to work through this year, but you're good. You're feeling comfortable with it. <laughs> Right. I can talk about the finances and how we've had to like figure all this finances out probably for the rest of the afternoon, but I won't. Um, so as long and if Stella feels comfortable and you feel comfortable, we can move on. But I'm always happy to answer questions about that. And we've talked about that a little bit when we talked about the administrative and occupancy as well. High level, since you did bring it, um, <clears throat> I won't put you on the spot for hard detailed numbers, but you're, you talked about your fund balance and then the revenue expected. Can you go over that one more time for me? You mentioned the fund balance of 29 million, I believe, and, and $22 million revenue. No, the budget was 29 million. Budget our is, FY23 budget is 29 million. Okay. Your budget is that. Okay. Yes. Our revenue is 22.1. What is your balance sheet total fund balance then? As a beginning? That's the number I don't have at the top of my head. That's the number I've always been interested in. Yeah. It's been really high. Yep. which signifies we, we have trouble getting the money to the service providers. At the, at the end of FY22, 
that number is set. So either we, we are at the 40% and it always changes. And that's why the number, I can't commit it to my head because it changes based on the expenditures of the year because the formula is wonky. Um, so we either have that money, like that much. And I'm, I think it, it I don't want to say, cause I can't even, it's somewhere between 12 and 16 million. Um, if we're over that amount, then our state payment, our 22.1 will be reduced by that amount. So we will have 21 point million available to us to spend no matter what in FY23. It's whether some of it comes from us or all of it comes from the state. It's a little bit weird how they figure that out, um, but it's, it's a set amount based on the previous year's expenditures. And we're still in our accrual period. Like we don't have our audit done. So I don't know what our ending, final ending fund balance is. Yep. All right. Um, other things in priority tier one, a more unified data structure. We ultimately, and this is my goal, FY25, I would like the region to work towards um, out, outcomes-based contracting. And we can't do that until we have a better, better handle on the data and what, what we're providing. And I don't want to say that we don't have that because we do. We have a lot of data on what we're paying for. The, the thing about it is, is outcomes as far as like access to services. We have um, a great number of really good providers in our region and they all keep a data set, but we don't know what their data set is. Like, I don't know how often they pull their data and what they pull and how, you know, how they're looking at it from an analytical standpoint. So this year we'd like to create what we're calling a data warehouse. We'd like to work with a group of our providers, kind of a mixture as a pilot, larger and smaller providers, medium size to say, what are you pulling? How often are you pulling it? And then look at what the commonalities are from a high level. You know, everybody's pulling um, referral date and then when a person gets in for services, for example and then put that all together from a regional, region-wide standpoint so that we have a better comprehensive view of what's happening across the region and in pockets of the region. So in FY23, I would like to um, meet with the providers, design that data warehouse, FY24, implement the data warehouse region-wide, and FY25, we move to outcomes-based contracting so that we make sure that we have the data as the baseline and the data that we need to measure if the providers are meeting their outcomes. Um, the other thing with data, the data analytics, uh, financial dashboard for the region, this was a priority last year. And um, <laughs> I don't even think it was priority tier one last year. I think I moved it up this year because I feel so strongly about it. We entered into a contract with a, a very large national provider last year to help us do this, to create a financial dashboard so that we were transparent and the provider ghosted us. I mean, like we, we literally never heard from them again. They didn't even send us an invoice, which I'm glad because we probably would have paid it. Even when I sent them a letter terminating the agreement, I, I never, never heard ever from them again. So it made it on the list again this year. We wanna make sure that we're, we're very transparent with our finances. So it's there to have that dashboard. A couple other things are evaluations. The regions have been um, in implementation for, for this is the eighth year now. And we've done a lot of development over the course of eight years. And I think it's time for us to pause just a little and say, okay, are we right-sized? Are we doing everything how we should? Do we have duplication? Do we have gaps? Do we have holes? So two things that we'll, doing, we'll be doing evaluations this year are um, crisis services. We've developed and we've developed and we've developed and it's time for us to say, okay, wait, is it enough? Is it too much? Is it not enough still? And then the same thing with service coordination. We have our own social workers that work for the region. We also have integrated health homes that are provided through the MCOs. We have our law enforcement liaisons. We have our crisis stabilization community-based services. We have a lot of entities who are doing service coordination. And some of them are niches that are important. But again, do we have duplication? Do we have enough? Is it right size? So we'll be doing those evaluations this year. We are um, also in priority tier one. We would like to work with our provider network on some mid-level management training. 
we've spent a lot of time, energy, and resources in the last two years on direct support professionals, those people who do the work every day. And like any industry right now, there's been a lot of turnover. And sometimes people have been elevated to mid-level management and agencies haven't had opportunities to really invest in their professional development. And mid-level management is really kind of what helps to to influence the culture of an organization and whether or not a DSP wants to stay employed there. So we'd like to help our provider network out this year with some mid-level management training. Um, that's it in priority tier one. Priority tier two, we talk about workforce, still an issue. Um, maybe even, you know, kind of pushing it out there. In FY22, we invested $1 million in our providers and technology. We bought a lot of hardware. We bought a lot of hardware and a lot of software. And now this year in FY23, it's, it's time to say to our providers, okay, well, what are you going to do with it? You know, like we, we know you were behind and you needed hardware. And so we invested that way. So now how can we use technology perhaps more innovatively to provide support to people with disabilities? Um, Co-occurring disorders is a, is a big issue. Uh, I think we all know from an anecdotal standpoint that it's time for the state to integrate substance use disorder, brain health issues, developmental disabilities, intellectual disabilities, and medical disabilities. Primarily, we, the, the rhetoric is around brain health issues and substance use disorder. Um, Iowa as a whole is behind a lot of states in the nation. And we, we would like to advocate to blend that funding. I have hope with the Iowa Department of Public Health and the Department of Human Services merging into the Health and Human Services Department that there's going to be movement policy and, and funding wise in that area. And I've said to the Regional Governing Board and to our staff that I would like the Central Region to be a leader in that movement. So we have a committee of coordinators we just met last week to talk about the research that we need to do and kind of our talking points and how we will advocate um, state and, and nationally for the integration of co-occurring disorders. Partner with healthcare agencies to provide targeted brain health support. Um, we've spent, again, a lot of time, energy, and resources in the last two years on education, and they needed it. And I'm not saying it was time wasted, but it, we'd like to shift our attention this year to people who work in healthcare because they have been impacted and, and their brain health has um, really been impacted by the last two years. First, the, of course, you know, the pandemic and, and just resulting changes in healthcare industry that there, there are a lot of people who are suffering and we really wanna target them and let them know just like we do with our broad campaign that it's okay if you need help and help is available. So targeting people in healthcare. And brain health prevention services for children. That's the shortest one in there, but for me, it's one of the most important. And I added it as a priority initiative because I'm, I'm, I'm really proud of our regional governing board that they approved in our, our budget this year, a $1 million line item for children's brain health prevention. Um, I think we all recognize that if we invest in children and we help children to be um, emotionally whole, then they will grow up to be well, adults, contributing adults. So we, we put a lot of emphasis on children this year and their prevention. Uh, we have the per, uh, pursue centralization of regional administration. You know, we've talked about it this morning. It's something is like, this needs to be talked about it and let's, you know, let's have it on here and at a minimum, think about some pay equity amongst our staff. I don't, I'm, I'm very clear here that equity doesn't mean equality. And I don't necessarily think staff in every county should be paid the same, but I, we have such a wide variance. I would like for us to maybe for our finance committee to bring maybe some pay ranges for each of our um, positions within the region to just create a little bit more equity that way. So that's it in pri priority tier two. And priority tier three is to continue the work. Last year, we did an evaluation of the peer support services in our region. Our committee came forth with recommendations. So it's in priority tier three this year to, to fulfill those recommendations to continue that work. Um, training for regional staff. This is, this is kind of one that's near and dear to my heart too. We have right now, each of the coordinators, uh, when they do their budget for the year, they they do a budget for training, um, but we don't have a plan. And people kind of self-select what training they want to go to. Like, for example, I'm I'm interested in eating disorders. 
right? So I might go to a whole bunch of training on eating disorders. Well, that's all well and good and it's helpful, but it's not necessarily big picture because how much of our population on our clientele that we support have an eating disorder. So what we'd like to do is to create kind of a regional plan that ha identifies some of those bigger picture items, trauma-informed care, suicide prevention, co-occurring disorders, and have a, a, a plan which says like all staff of the region every other year, every three years, I don't know what it's gonna look like yet, we'll have, a min we'll have suicide prevention training and then allow for some flexibility. You know, there, here's your core training that you'll receive at whatever interval. And then you also still have the flexibility to self-select. So if I'm still interested in eating disorders, I can do an eating disorder training. So just to shore that up a little bit and to um, build the capacity of our staff in the region a little bit more consistently and equitably. And then the last one is service development for people who have complex needs, which might require collaboration with other regions. And Supervisor McDonough is nodding at me because we have um, been trying for over a year to develop a service called ERSH, Intensive Residential Support Homes. And we had released an RFP in March or April. We had one proposal and then within five days that provider withdrew their proposal. And they said to me, may we really wanna do this. We really wanna be a partner with the region, but we don't have the staff to, to, to implement the services that we currently have, let alone develop a new service. So, I mean, it's, so there's, you know, the requirement of us to be collaborative with other regions and perhaps use services in other regions until we feel like going back up to priority tier two, we address more workforce and we create some stability amongst our provider networks so that they can develop those services for us. So questions, comments on that? Concerns with the direction that the region's heading? I realized I had hard copies of this for you and I, I didn't hand them out, so. I'm gonna hand them out now. I appreciate May as, a, as the supervisor who is assigned to the Regional Governing Board that you do a, a thorough and, and a thorough job with the governing board in stepping us through each of these things. Um, my understanding of the region and, and the work that we do has grown over my three and a half year term. But a lot of that is because of uh, the organization and the communication, the directed communication that you, you bring. So. You. I, you know, and again, Supervisor Potoff is on those Zoom meetings, and I don't know what the world looks like when you try to learn this from the outside kind of looking in, but it it is um, really been great to work with you, and the region is, you know, I, every year I say to my colleagues, if you want to be the governing board, on the governing board, it's an opportunity that I would share. There's a bit of a learning curve, but other counties do change that out or they create a very active um, first supervisor and then um, the second supervisor that kind of alternate attendance. So these conversations even that we're having today might be assisted by having two or three of us rotate through to better understand what's happening in this important work. So thank you. And I would add along that line, you see on there the, the bubbles next to each priority and the status key um, to the left. At the end of every quarter, I go to the regional governing board and I move one of those status keys into one of those keys into a bubble so that we, so that we're, it's just, it, it's accountability, right? It's keeping us accountable for the work that we're doing. Like we've, we've, this is operational, we've completed it, we have some progress, we have steady progress, whatever that is, just to, to check in with the regional governing board on a quarterly level, like we are doing this work. In May, when I brought this to the, to the board, they said, wow, this is a really aggressive plan. That's a lot of work for this year. And I said, yeah, but I believe in us and I think we can do it. So we've got committees who are, I missed one of the committee meetings this morning to come here. So we've got committees who are actively working on this and we're, we're getting this work rolling. Other comments? I appreciate you coming in with the information, May. Uh, I do try to attend a lot of the meetings, but see you on there. Conflicts quite frequently, so 
you miss some and you kind of it's hard to catch up sometimes because there's a lot of information going on uh, we have a meeting wednesday but i already have a one o'clock public safety meeting that day so well we changed it this month because of isaac so yeah it's usually the fourth thursday and this month many of our members are planning to attend isaac's annual conference and so it got moved this month yeah I don't have anything further. Thank you. Yep. To adjourn. I will second that. A motion and a second to adjourn. All in favor, signify by aye. 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 We stand adjourned. Thank you, Jay. Thank you, Ann. Thank you, Kevin.